And it's my great pleasure and honor to be here with you and with uh, such distinguished uh, panelists uh, to discuss such an important topic. Uh, perhaps to get us, get us kicked off, um, I'd like to turn to you, uh, you Fabrizio. Uh, you've been leading uh, the UN Secretary General's Roadmap on Digital Cooperation, and obviously inclusive digital economies has been a major aspect of, of some of the work that you've done. <coughs> Uh, would you mind sharing some thoughts on some of the key considerations that have emerged from the roadmap uh, as it relates to digital economies and in particular inclusive digital economies? Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And I think this discussion is is very timely. I mean, the roadmap, if, if there's one theme that dominates the roadmap, it is inclusion, uh, inequality and inclusion are probably next to climate change, and the Secretary General has said this, the, the greatest challenge uh, of, of our time. While the world has done a pretty good job up until COVID in uh, eradicating or diminishing poverty, in terms of equality and inclusion, we've gone backwards. Uh, since the financial crisis, inequality has grown worse in two out of three countries. And of course, with COVID, uh, everything has been greatly exacerbated. COVID has seen the 2,000 richest people on earth increase their fortunes uh, by about $2.7 trillion, while at the same time, according to the World Bank, uh, the number of people living in extreme poverty uh, has grown for the first time in many decades and is likely to grow by 150 million. That's equivalent uh, to the population of a number of medium-sized uh, countries. Now, this is relevant because inequality um, is mirrored and to extend, grand extent exacerbated by the digital sphere. The connectivity or the lack of it um, traces and exacerbates inclusive, existing patterns of, um, of inclusion and, and exclusion. Um, and I think what we have to bear in mind is the notion of a digital economy. I don't want to be overly provocative, but the notion of a digital um, um, economy is, is increasingly, I don't know how to say this diplomatically, uh, spurious. The, the point being that the economy is digital. The analog economy is rapidly disappearing. Eight out of 10 of the largest, of the highest value companies in the world are digital. And the two that are not digital, Walmart and Coca-Cola, could not function anymore without digital technologies. So th 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 there is, you know, the, the analog economy is, is a bit like subsistence agriculture. It, it exists, but it's increasingly marginal. Um, so if, if we're not digitized, it's not that we don't have access to something called the digital economy. It's that we don't have increasingly won't have access to any sort of economy. And I think that under COVID has become very clear. People who are connected, like most of us, could continue working. People who were not connected, with few exceptions, couldn't continue working. People who are connected could continue their education. People who were not connected could not, etc. So. The, the issue of connectivity is the new face of exclusion and inequality, and it needs to be tackled comprehensively. And I think the scorecard that you've put up, the ID scorecard, is points to exactly the issues that are required resolving. Infrastructure, but although infrastructure is often overstated as a constraint, the Broadband Commission has made clear that 93% uh, of the world, I think, now is theoretically connected to broadband. The constraints are about affordability, about devices, about policy, um, about uh, skills training. And these are all issues where the uh, Secretary General's roadmap and what followed on from it his high level, his panel, his expert panel on fintech have made very concrete and specific recommendations. It's clear that there are many valuable uh, efforts ongoing and many valuable examples of very good progress. Rwanda and Kenya, who are part of this event, are two extraordinary uh, examples of what can be achieved. 
But frankly, it's also clear that the existing efforts are not to scale and not always adequately coordinated. And I think that's the overall aim of the roadmap, is to try and bring our efforts up to scale and to try and get better coordination and more investment into the many worthwhile efforts uh, that are out there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fabrizio. And as you said, uh, you know, digitalization comes with its own set of opportunities, but also its own sets of risks and barriers that we would need to collectively overcome if you really want to reduce inequalities and drive more inclusion. And you mentioned as well how important uh, inclusion was as one of the greatest challenges of our time. And maybe this is sort of the perfect question uh, to ask our next speakers, Governor Patrick Njoroge from Central Bank of Kenya, because uh, worldwide, Kenya is regarded as a model in terms of financial inclusion. You have been driving a whole range of policies that have directly supported the marginalized in society to really drive greater financial inclusion in Kenya. Can you share with us some of the um, some of the lessons you've learned from that that experience? Obviously, CBK has played a central role in driving financial inclusion in Kenya uh, in exceptional ways. And so could you share some lessons and some insights and also how that might relate now to Kenya's efforts towards really transitioning towards an inclusive digital economy? Uh, over to you, Patrick. Thank you, Isa. Um, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. I'm delighted uh, to be part of this panel and uh, obviously discussing a very important topic. Our financial inclusion journey in Kenya as uh, was as uh, Fabrizio mentioned a moment ago, um, really we have a lot in common with uh, several other countries, and uh, we have brought a lot of people into the financial system. Now, our financial inclusion transformation started around uh, 2007, and this is with the advent of the M-Pesa platform. And at that point, we had uh, in 2006, we had a level of inclusion was at 23 percent adult population. And now we are at 83 percent. 83 percent of Kenyan um, adults have uh, been brought into or already in the financial system, have access to the financial system. And this has been underpinned by the digitalization, particularly of uh, the mobile phone technologies. However, it is important to note that it wasn't just the mobile phone technology that did it, meaning, you know, giving people mobile phones and having them in their hand. That obviously was not um, the only thing. The transformation was anchored on three pillars. The need, the needs of people, collaboration, and a certain risk management. Obviously, this is now with the benefit of hindsight. Um, and if you don't mind, I'll just go through this a little. So in terms of uh, the first of this, people's needs must indeed inform the products and services that are riding on the digital rails once the digital rails are there. So the technology is there, um, and that is obviously comes with the, with the, uh, the handsets, et cetera. But people's needs must inform the products and services. Secondly, the various institutions, government, private sector, innovators, consumers come together. They need to come together to create an ecosystem. It is important to realize that you, you want that network externalities as it were. So you do want to create that ecosystem. And finally, the risks to consumers should be identified and mitigated to, endanger, to engender trust. That is important. It isn't enough to say that uh, I'm going to transfer money to you. I need to know that actually to get to you. So the element of trust is extremely important, um, particularly if it is a new system that has not been tested, et cetera, et cetera. So going forward, as you asked, um, countries that are moving to broader inclusive uh, digital economies, in our view, needs need to obviously uh, focus on the needs of people. And now this range from health, education, agriculture, etc., cetera, um, social needs and all that. And to underscore that we must not be carried away by technology. 
um, technology and innovation, those are important, but they are tools and they should, and the element of uh, all of them should be focused on the needs of people. Second, secondly, the collaboration. So building an inclusive digital economy requires all these institutions, government, private sector, et cetera, to come together and work together aligned in a common vision. And obviously the final one, as I mentioned, risk management, um, so the digital economies are built on trust and uh, any breaches may endanger the viability of an inclusive digital economy. And I should add, it isn't just breach in terms of uh, the fast transaction like money and all that, but it's also other things, for instance, data breaches, etc. It is actually much more encompassing. Thank you very much, Aiza. Thank you very much, uh, Governor Patrick. You mentioned a few very important points here, uh, focusing on the needs of the people, focusing on, on collaboration, which are really two important topics that I would like to explore a little bit further with our next speakers who are representatives from the private sector. And I think what the element of risk that you have mentioned, but also that Fabrizio mentioned a bit earlier in terms of the, the risk of divide, the risk of further exclusion is something that I would also like to come back to during the course of this conversation. But perhaps if I turn to Irene uh, from AirAsia, uh, if you don't mind, I think one of the things that um, Governor Patrick has just mentioned was collaboration with the private sector and the role of the private sector. And I think Judith in her uh, introduction was also alluding to the fact that different sectors are digitalizing and the transportation sector obviously is no exception. We already know of all the ride hailing services that have gone through digital transformation. Perhaps the airline industry seems a little bit less natural, I would say. So can you tell us uh, from an airline business to becoming more of a platform type of business. What is it that triggered your digital transformation and what are the opportunities that you actually saw out there that you wanted to pursue through this transformation? Um, over to you, Irene. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so our digital transformation exercise actually started more than three years ago. And this happens because we realized that we have a wealth of data coming from various systems of our operations. And um, as one of the, as the biggest low cost carrier in Asia, uh, we, a lot of our bookings goes through our website and through our mobile uh, app. 80% of those bookings are actually coming from those website and mobile apps. So we actually own that data. Um, and we're one of the largest um, in Southeast Asia in relation to the roots and the network and the market reach and the brand that we have and being part of that growth in Southeast Asia where majority of uh, population are growing out the, uh, the middle income earners themselves. So we thought that it was just conducive for Red Asia to be able to be, be part of that um, Southeast Asian growth uh, and so forth. So when we saw how much data that we own, whether it's through our operations or whether through our booking systems and so forth, really realized that it becomes a wealth of asset for us. And we felt that we needed to work this asset even more. Um, and as a result, we decided to ingest all that data into a foundry, we put them into cloud. And from there, we saw the the vis we had more visibility of what this data can do. We saw how it can be targeted to improve uh, the conversion rate of all the revenues and so forth. And we felt that it can be more personalized and more targeted to our consumer base and so forth. We felt that we can improve the operational costs uh, because we felt the whole operations, I mean, because AirAsia is, is a huge volume of transaction and a huge volume of operations in terms of the number of flights that we have and the 25 minutes turnaround that we have and the number of hours that our planes fly and so forth. So a lot of that data was very useful for us to improve uh, the way we operate and to reduce that cost further, even to the point where we can reduce that fuel consumption by another percentage point, we could translate to millions of dollars. And of course, this was pre-COVID time and so forth. And we saw how that data can also help improve um, the whole consumer journey from the moment they book until they return and what they can do in between in, in during 
the time when they, they they're journeying to the airport, what they do in the airport, what they do in flight, what once they land into their destination, what kind of activities that they do, and um, and once they come back, what sort of things that they look uh, towards to uh, uh, to be able to come home um, and enjoy that whole journey as well. Um, so we saw that um, through all this. Uh, initiative um, there's a lot that we can do and we felt that we can do we can be more than just an ally and so we pivoted in a big way I mean we started this pivot in a small way about two years or so but COVID struck and we took that opportunity that three-year roadmap have just reduced to a nine-month roadmap uh, we saw that all those traffic that goes into airshare.com how can we make use of those and how can we actually offer more things to our uh, consumers uh, so they no longer fly? How can we help them be able to uh, enjoy the lifestyle that they have during the pandemic, during the lockdown period? And how can we actually provide the basic necessities up to their doorsteps and so forth? And hence the birth of that super app that we're working on. Um, and then we saw the opportunity of logistic, which was initially our cargo department, and we felt that we can be more than just a cargo department uh, with the kind of network that we have, the market reach that we have, because we fly to tertiary cities. We don't just fly to capital cities. We fly to cities where many don't even fly. In fact, 30% of our routes were unique routes um, uh, that we fly into Southeast Asia. So we set the trend, we create economic activity over there, and then soon we find other airlines follow us because of the fact that we have created that many opportunities for the community. And, um, and hence we saw that, you know, why not we do the same thing for movements of goods so where we can move the goods to various cities that nobody could fly to as well. And we saw that it's not just about freight uh, movements, but it's also about last mile delivery, parcels delivery to support the e-commerce boom that you find in this region uh, and so forth. And, um, and we saw how consumers were behaving in terms of what they pay and the transactions that they do and what makes them loyal to a certain goods and services and so forth. And this come about the fintech that we created also uh, in Airisha Digital. And the fintech that we have created is called Big Pay, and that's meant to serve the under underbank and the unbank in this part of the world. And that's not meant just for consumers, but also for small medium enterprises, where they may not be able to get all the services that you find in a normal bank that would give to a corporation just because they don't meet a certain checklist. And this is where we felt that we could provide that opportunity uh, for them. So in our FinTech business, uh, we have money lending license, we have remittances license and e-money licenses, and that's what we have in Malaysia. And in Singapore, we have the e-money license and remittance license. And we want to do be able to do the same in Philippines and in uh, Thailand as well as in Indonesia. So whatever that we build is meant to be for the region because there's a lot of opportunities that we can serve. And we felt that since we started as a low-cost carrier, serving those who never flown before is an opportunity for us to repurpose those assets and try to serve um, the same masses, but based on various verticals that were underserved um, in the economy. Thank you very much, Irene. I think this is a very exciting example of how an industry having access to data on their customers and really being smart about the data can harness their ecosystem in digitally transforming themselves and driving a whole range of financial and non-financial services that bring added value to the lives of the people and really address the needs of the people, um, as Patrick was saying before. I'll come back to you a bit later to get a sense of how do you actually overcome barriers to reach those specific segments in the B14 in Malaysia. But before doing that, I'd like to turn to Biram, another serial uh, digital tech entrepreneur uh, from West Africa. I think, Biram, if I understood correctly, you're in the process of building 
uh, a B2B marketplace that, that is going to be serving the unbanked and some of the marginalized populations in uh, Senegal by giving them ha- access to online digital markets. And I would like to get a sense from you of, you know, how are you thinking about the, um, the opportunity and the potential impact that, that you can achieve in Senegal and, and where the need is and where you actually fit uh, in, in the Senegalese context? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Thank you very much and very happy to be here uh, amongst everyone. Um, so, yes, after a number of years in the in the United States, it's been very interesting trying to build a tech startup here in Senegal, where I'm from originally, and uh, specifically trying to focus on the B2B market and understanding what are the main challenges that... Um, that that basically sellers are having, knowing that we already have a proven, um, we have we already have proven demand, not necessarily just within inter Africa trade, but as well as trade from Africa towards um, the rest of the world. The demand is there. Where we find the biggest challenges are around um, access to the market, especially coming from a francophone country. Uh, let's say trying to sell to. Um, a buyer in the United States, just language becomes a barrier. But then the second major barrier that we also see outside of just access to the market is um, the ability to actually fund uh, the transformation of the products um, before being able to uh, send them out to 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 the buyer. And then the third area is really understanding all the challenges around compliance and understanding what uh, what is really needed to be able to sell your products outside of, of Senegal, for example. And so what we focused on is not necessarily just a digital platform that gives access to the buyers the ability to understand what are all the products that are available in our market and uh, present it to them in a way that they used to see it today um, when it comes to quality, when it comes to the options available, when it comes to the language and payment um, options that are available. But there's another sort of non-digital aspect to all of this, which is really focusing on packaging. Uh, because packaging is one of the biggest issues when we talk about um, uh, transformation of consumer uh, consumer goods, especially that most of the products are produced by people that don't necessarily live in the city that may not have the level of education that is expected um, to be able to to meet all the requirements on the other side, they may not even be aware of all the requirements on the other side. And therefore going straight to them and giving them the opportunity to not necessarily just um, uh, just focus on what they're really good at, which is maybe the raw product, and maybe do some of the transformation, but then have us be able to handle all the packaging either based on the the buyer's needs, so uh, uh, focusing on customization, as well as focusing on on any kind of compliance challenges that they may have. Uh, This allows us, when we talk about B2B, what we also talk about is being able to order um, high volumes. And each of these producers today don't necessarily have the ability to um, to fund the production of of thousands of products within a particular time frame. So we use actually our technology not only to be able to identify who are the best vendors for that particular need that the, that the client has, but also uh, being able to um, divide the order across multiple producers. And in the end, be able to bring it all together through, as I mentioned before, the um, the packaging side, which in uh, which I would say is also another important piece when it comes to pricing and being competitive on a global market. Today, our products may not be that expensive to produce. Where they become very um, expensive is in our ability to um, to meet all of the requirements that. Uh, that the other markets uh, impose, um, but also in our ability to um, in our ability to to produce at at mass. So I think in what Quilly is doing right now, it's extremely important, not necessarily in the creation of jobs, but I think in giving 
um, in introducing all of the different um, all of the different skills that are needed for our current producers that again might not be in the city, might not have the level of education, to be able to make their products available to a larger market. And so that's really what our main focus is today, amongst amongst other things. But um that I would say is the biggest impact. So so I would say, uh, you know, if I were to summarize, in, in many ways, you're acting like uh, an equalizer in the market between large producers and small producers, reducing inequalities, allowing small producers to participate. And you've also mentioned a range of, of barriers. Uh, some are digital, some are non-digital. You mentioned language, you mentioned skilled, skills and capabilities in many ways, but there's also digital barriers. And I would like to turn back to the topic of digital barriers and, and, and the specific effects of digitalization, and maybe I'll turn to Governor Patrick to start with, and then I'd like to turn to Fabricio right right after that. I think, you know, as, as a financial regulator in Kenya, uh, Patrick, seeing digitalization transforming the entire financial sector and beyond the financial sector and bringing a whole new range of issues, it's cutting across sectors and industries, it's driving the emergence of global platforms, it's driving potential exclusion, all of these important matters requires specific attention. How does a regulator think about bringing in a smart regulatory environment? We know these are very fast paced, these are transformative. How, how do you see a smart environment from a regulator's perspective? What's your experience in Kenya and what insights could you share with us? Thank you. Well, actually I would say that uh, this, is, uh, this is the eternal problem. Uh, there's always uh, that question about what the regulators are doing. And uh, if you really want to push it, you could actually say, is the regulator stifling innovation that would probably lead to the, you know, maybe significant changes that um, we have seen in our neighborhood, but also as mentioned by, um, by the previous speakers, um, phenomenal steps forward. Well, what we what we believe is that as a regulator, you need to be very clear as to what your concerns are. Um, it's not the business of the regulator to sort of uh, sign off on innovation. Uh, that shouldn't be the case. Uh, but rather, you should be very clear about what is it that your concerns are. In particular, regulators would generally be concerned about financial stability and uh, things obviously about, uh, um, let's say, protection of consumers, um, data issues, etc., or cybersecurity, all those things. So those are fundamental elements in terms of uh, looking at any digital platform or looking at the entire uh, scope of uh, things or sort of things in the, in the area of uh, digital finance. So that is very important. And then, of course, you look at the product as it is brought. Um, and the first question we always ask the uh, the promoters is, OK, what is the um, what will the consumer? What is the benefit to the consumer? Because at the end of the day, you could have three million um, or even three billion of these uh, fintech products and things like that. But uh, in some sense, it would be a waste of uh, resources if you if you did not prioritize them from a perspective of uh, people you know what is it that they do so that is the way we look at it and then of course to realize that you the fintech or should we say the promoter is also on a journey and you have to walk that journey with um, the promoters so they are not necessarily bringing a finished product to you and in a sense they probably haven't thought about the concerns that you have or the issues that you have, and therefore, for that matter, um, you do need to walk the journey with them, as we have done with all of them. And eventually, they'll move the product from, let's say, a proof of concept to um, eventually, you know, a beta version, and eventually something that really makes sense. That said, there's one item I'd want to put on the table, which is becoming much more worrisome or let's say much more important. And this is the general question about governance of the digital platforms. You see, now we are getting, we are relying more and more on global digital platforms. And this is even for your day-to-day -day sort of transactions, etc. And uh, the trouble here is that they are, trans they are transcending national boundaries. 
and with significant spillovers into all countries. And I think the issue here is that it is imperative for us to engage in um, a sort of a global dialogue on their governance um, because they do they will change our countries and therefore we in the developing nations or emerging markets um, really should be at the table um, discussing uh, the global governance of uh, of these products. Of course, the point here is that there there's a lot of bias in my in my view. Um, on uh, the technology side, you know, technology centric sort of discussions and not the people centric side and uh, particularly with regard to data governance. So I'll stop there, but I hope I've given you some elements um, of how we approach uh, this whole business of uh, governance and indeed uh, regulation. Thank you very much, Governor Patrick. I think what you mentioned is sort of the, the hallmark of, of CBK practice uh, and approach to innovation and, and uh, regulation of innovation. And this is extremely exciting. You, you mentioned a whole new uh, set of challenges around uh, data, algorithm, cybersecurity, the emergence of these global platforms. And I'd really be keen to hear from, uh, from Fabrizio because obviously these are inevitably conversations that that have been held in the context of the roadmap for digital cooperation. This is a core issue that's been addressed in many different ways. And I'd be keen to hear from you, Fabrizio, how do you see that issue unfolding and particularly that of all these sort of exacerbated risks that come from extreme digitalization or advanced digitalization? And how could we achieve greater uh, cooperation in a way around digital governance, which will be needed if we are to govern global digital platforms? What are the, uh, the the key insights from the from the roadmap that you can share with us on this topic? Well, I I think the the governor uh, Patrick put it very very eloquently. I mean, these technologies, by definition, um, don't recognize borders. Uh, these technologies are are transnational, and to try and contain them within borders is extremely costly and and not very realistic to try and erect cyber borders. I don't think any single country, some have invested billions in it, but it's not clear that any has really succeeded. And it's certainly not feasible for, for smaller countries. So I think first we have to recognize that. And then I do think we need much greater international uh, cooperation for two reasons. One, greater international cooperation to overcome the digital divide. It's very hard to see how that's going to happen without greater international cooperation. We have to recognize that the progress in achieving connectivity, which is the basis for digital, the, the, an inclusive digital economy, the, the, the pace at which that's happened is slowing down dramatically. There's an ITU report that came out last week that highlighted this. And that's very understandable because it's been left largely to market forces. It's been left largely to, to profit incentives. And market forces and profit incentives have got just about where, where they can go. And where they can't go is to the excluded and the economic disadvantaged because it's no longer profitable. So we need um, much greater public policies at a, at a national level, at a regional level, and at an international level to overcome that. And we also have to recognize that the, the, the reality now is that at the international level, a huge amount of diplomatic and political effort is not going into enhancing cooperation, but into enhancing fractures. I mean, there's barely a day that goes by without some report of a new sign of, of superpower rivalry in the digital sphere. And the digital sphere is, is, is rapidly becoming the surrogate battlefield uh, for the superpowers. And that's not conducive to overcoming the digital divide, nor is it conducive to dealing with the other major issue for which we need international cooperation, which is to make sure that connectivity is not just there, but that it's meaningful safe and secure and that it upholds human rights and that goes to exactly the point that the governor made that we need to put people at the center it has to be not about profit not about i mean uh, 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 hegemony it needs to be about the best interest of individual human beings 
And somewhere along the line, I think that was very much in the vision of the, the Internet founders who had this great vision of democratizing knowledge. But somewhere along the line, that priority seems to have sort of dropped down the list a little. So we really need international cooperation and country, the, and above all also to bring in the, the voices of the global south. Now, to the extent there's a discussion, the voices of the global south are not so present in that discussion. But we also need a new form of international cooperation. It can't just be about states. Whether we like it or not, this, te these te this technological wave, this in fourth industrial revolution, as some refer to it, is very much driven by the private sector. So the private sector need to be fully at the table. And then, of course, we also need civil society, not least to keep us focused on individual human beings. So it needs to be much more stake multi-stakeholder than previous forms of international cooperation. And that's how we've been working with the high level panel on digital cooperation. That's how we've been working with the Secretary General's roadmap. We've had multi-stakeholder groups. We've done our utmost to get countries involved who are not usually part of the debate, in especially the least developed countries. Um, and I think that's how we need to, to proceed. And we need to sort of change the international logic from one that is heavily now involved in, in friction and competition to one that doesn't ignore the real differences that exist in some of the policy areas, but acknowledges much better what we all stand to gain from greater international cooperation. And that's what the Secretary General is, is working for. Thank you very much, Fabrizio. So I, I really note the need for, for a new uh, geometry of participants around the table in terms of different types of regulators discussing that fundamental issue and also the need for uh, an extended geography of participants with developing economies uh, coming to the table as well to bring their expertise and put their discuss, you know, bring their expertise, their experience, but also discuss their needs. Uh, in many ways in, in terms of longer development outcomes. And I think obviously, as you said, putting the needs of the people at the center again, putting citizens back to the center and building um, the architecture of governance of global digital finance platforms around those needs are going to be really important. I'd like to go back to uh, the, the national level uh, conversation. You alluded to the fact that, of course, there's a need for policy coordination at the international level, also at the national level. Uh, and I'd like to turn to, to Governor Patrick for this and maybe then to Biram. But before we discuss the national level coordination, uh, one point you made was that those platforms were becoming increasingly international, transborder uh, in, in many ways. And so I'd like to turn to Irene. Uh, I promise you to ask you the question about how do you target the bottom of the pyramid and how do you actually overcome the barriers to, to target the B40 in Malaysia? But keeping in mind that this is a, a borderless transnational play in a sense, and you are a transnational airline carrier. Do you have uh, plans to, to expand also internationally? And how do you, how do you see that happening? Uh, if you would like to share some thoughts with us. Yes, sure. I can give an example of what we did during the lockdown period earlier this year due to the pandemic. Um, so when everyone was asked to stay home and there's no economic activities and we had to ground our planes, so what can we do? What can we use our platform for? Um, and uh, that's where I actually explain how we turned it around and we decided that let's use that platform to sell other things um, that people are, are, are looking for right now, which is the basic necessities, which is food, your groceries, and so forth. I mean, that platform initially was meant to sell duty-free or travel retail, but there was just no point for us to continue that. So, so hence, we quickly pivot into what we see and what we know and what we can deliver uh, using the existing assets and repurposing them as well. And we re actually repurpose our pilots and cabin crew to deliver those goods right to the doorsteps um, in the various countries that we're in. So during that period, we saw that the SMEs were struggling and the government was trying their best to help the SMEs. Um, and what we did was we said, look, we have a platform here let's create a campaign and we call that campaign Save Our Shop Campaign, SOS. 
Um, and, um, and within a couple of days, we saw a thousand over SMEs registered on our platform. I mean, we, we could only do this first in Malaysia. And then eventually we opened up to the other countries in the region. Um, and so what we did was we helped them put their business in the platform where, bef where in the current, in that situation during the lockdown period, they couldn't be able to open up their business or sell anywhere that they could because they were more, they were very traditional and brick and mortar kind of thing. And we guide them in terms of how they should operate that business in e-commerce. And as a result, also, we provide that delivery service coming from our logistic company called Teleport that provide that last mile delivery and so forth. Um, and what we notice as we put these SMEs on board is that they lack the technical skills to understand how to build an e-commerce business. And this is where we came in um, from the academy side, because we have a tech academy and we built this academy initially to rescale our own staff because we felt that as we become more and more digitalized and as we be use more and more machine learning kind of um, uh, initiative and, and, and work and so forth, we felt that a lot of our staff would probably need to be redeployed and we felt as a responsible employer, we need to reskill them and we need them to be able to learn new skills like how to become a data analyst or how to code or um, you know learn how to be uh, to learn how to use cloud and so forth and digital marketing and all that kind of thing and we have a good partner to work with us on this in our digital transformation and that partner that we have is google so we co-created a co-curriculum for our staff to be reskilled and we felt that with this new SMEs who don't even have a clue in terms of how to uh, advertise themselves or take photos or build a homepage, create more traffic or to help them with digital marketing and so forth. We created a co-curriculum for the small medium enterprises who are struggling. And we said, come to our course. It's not, you know, it doesn't cost a thing. Uh, it's very marginal cost also. And we guide them in terms of how they should be able to conduct that business on our platform or so. Because for us, we felt that if we put the small medium enterprises or the micro entrepreneurs on our platform, it has to last for a long time. It cannot be just for the time where they were struggling during the lockdown period and so forth. And as a result of this, there were farmers and fishermen who were also struggling to offload tonnage of their produce. Um, and they saw how we were, you know, helping out the small medium enterprises and so forth. Um, and the Ministry of Agriculture came up to us and said, how can you help the fishermen and the farmers? Because they need to offload tonnage of their produce and they can't just sell a few kilograms here and there to consumers and so forth. So what we did is we had to create a new business uh, and it's called Our Farm. And what we did was we matched the farmers and the uh, fishermen directly to, uh, to the merchants on our platform. And these are merchants that we, uh, we already have, such as restaurant owners or uh, grow, um, supermarket or mini marts uh, and so forth. And we also created, uh, we also built up our, our merchant database as well. So, now you see that there's over a thousand farmers that has registered in our farm um, in Malaysia. I mean, we just established this in July this year, and we're going to um, roll this out to other countries in the region where we have our market reach and we have our brand uh, that people recognize and so forth. So, so, so that's how we actually reach out to the B40s, uh, the micro entrepreneurs. Um, we also have our, I didn't mention about in-flight catering where we turn into a restaurant business um, because during the uh, pandemic, um, our rest, we, we actually built up a restaurant. This restaurant was just, was actually a year old because we saw that how our own passengers 
like our food a lot and they felt that can they buy them even though they're not flying so hence we decided to open a restaurant and test it out and we saw that it became really popular um, and and then we felt that it could be a franchise business and then we could create cloud kitchen as well so that franchise business we finally got that license about a month ago and we have about uh, close to 20 people who are um, already in becoming a franchise in Malaysia and so forth. So that was an opportunity also for small mid, um, micro entrepreneurs uh, to come in and learn how to be a franchisee. And mm. we managed to work with the government also who provide loans for franchises because they see that the FNB and franchise business is one of the successful business to help the B40s and to help them become better entrepreneurs and so forth. Uh, so that's another way on how we actually reach out to them. Uh, and of course, there's also that uh, fintech business uh, that we have where we're reaching out to, to micro entrepreneurs, to the B40s to help them uh, help them get loans and so forth and all that. We have a whole list of things, but uh, yeah. mine time. And so that's um, one of the examples that we reach out to B40s. Thank you very much, Irene, uh, for this very comprehensive response. Uh, I wouldn't say that um, I look forward to getting on a plane again, but that's probably the closest I've gotten to it uh, in recent months, um, hopefully at some point on, on Air Asia. But so, listen, in, in many ways, what you said, and I would like to go back to the, um, to the conversation about domestic pol policy coordination and domestic coordination between different actors. And I'd like to start with Governor Patrick and then maybe um, move to Biram. Um, you know, as Fabrizio was saying, there's a need for greater policy coordination at the national level across multiple actors and multiple stakeholders. Um, what's your experience, uh, Governor Patrick, in, in Kenya in terms of, you know, the kind of stakeholders that are around the table, the type of conversations that are happening? How is sort of this, this broader dialogue organized and structured in Kenya at the moment. What's your experience in that space? Thank you. Um, really picking up on uh, your thoughts on this, it is clear that uh, we cannot, um, let's say, continue moving forward in sort of disjointedly, you know, in a sort of a disjointed fashion. Um, so there is need for some sort of understanding, clarity of vision, alignment, um, uh, by or amongst all the stakeholders, um, in the, everybody that really uh, has an interest um, in the outcome of uh, the digital economy. And that is really what has happened here in Kenya. And, uh, and we have anchored this on a digital economy blueprint that was launched just in May last year, 2019. And the blueprint is anchored on five pillars and this uh you know a digital government digital business um strengthening infrastructure that is key as you can imagine innovative uh, or innovation driven entrepreneurship and uh, digital skills and values those five elements are really uh, what anchor uh, our vision of uh, digital economy going forward. So it, we are no longer now in the area of just uh, financial um, innovation, et cetera, et cetera. It's the entire gamut. So it's a 360 sort of uh, look at the economy. And I think this is a point that Fabrizio mentioned at the beginning when he was talking about the digital economy. Um, is it going forward? Um, and the analog one is still should we say another century back as it were so what is the point here every one of the actors or every one of the, the private sector first of course let's begin with government and the government obviously needs to uh, refresh its systems and i think there are a lot of governments have made progress here where you can do a lot of uh, a lot of the services can be obtained um on e-platforms um and, you know, from medical all the way to passport uh, um, or passport uh, requests and uh, et cetera, it's applications, et cetera, et cetera. Um, visa as well, et cetera. Then obviously digital business. And uh, this is very important that uh, 
that the platforms that are being used by are digital as well. Mind you, this is important also for another thing, which is when you begin thinking about uh, um, taxation and things like that, things are much easier if all that, or AML, CFT, if all that is on a sort of a digital platform. Infrastructure is very important. And I think the point here is we need to be sure going forward that we are not cornered in one form of technology that is sort of, uh, let's say, get stuck there. You know, we get paralyzed in a particular, and now there's discussions about um, the 5Gs and all these other things. I mean, the point here is that the infrastructure needs to be uh, scalable and obviously has to be backward compatible in particular ways, et cetera. But there's more than that. Now we are thinking of fiber connections to key uh, rural places, and I've seen India is also doing the same. So this is important. It's important to have fiber connection to um, around the country. Um, and that is how those people in the rural areas will actually join in the digital sort of, um, yeah, the digital highway. Innovation, I think I don't want to say too much about uh, because I have already spoken about it. And, uh, and then finally, making sure that the digital skills and values are there. And, I, and uh, this isn't just an issue of uh, financial education, etc. cetera. Um, it, is, uh, it ranges from even things like uh, digital etiquette and, uh, and also appreciation of what the innovators should be doing in terms of protecting the private the private individuals etc so this is really an important um, sort of uh, direction that we've taken finally as i finish it is important to uh, realize that each one is working in its mandate but at the same time there's a lot of cooperation and indeed for governments there's a sort of cross government cooperation um, on some of the things that they are doing Thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, I always enjoy the simplicity with which you explain things that make them feel so natural and make them feel so easy to implement. And yet it is nothing short of being extraordinary, the level of sophistication that you have achieved in Kenya in terms of cross-agency, government-level coordination is really a, a model uh, to, to dig into a little bit more and, and explore and, and get inspiration from. I'd like to turn to, to Biram, maybe to tell us in the case of Senegal, um, if you can, I think this issue of cooperation and not so much within the government itself, but between the government and yourself in a way, because you're building this B2B marketplace. The government is also using your services somehow to think about an e-commerce, uh, national e-commerce agenda in, in Senegal. How is that coordination between the, the public sector and, and you as a private sector, in a sense, happening in, in Senegal? Yes, thank you, thank you. And before I get to that, just because it's a bit related, um, when we talk about, um, especially African countries and developing countries, having a seat at the table when we're having those important discussions about governments and others, there's one thing to have a seat at the table, which I think is important, but there's another thing also to be heard once you're sitting at that table. And I believe that in order to be heard when sitting at that table, maybe coming from an entrepreneurial standpoint, you need to be disruptive. And disruptive means being able to own something that others are looking at and change the way people look at you and look at the way the nation is doing things or the continent is doing things. And therefore, you know, it's been important. Um, and, and a lot of that, I would say, disruption usually comes from the private sector, from the startups, from the entrepreneurial uh, sector, where we, we have the ability to move a lot faster, where we're a lot, a lot more agile and also a lot more willing to take risks. And then on the other side, you also have the government and the, the public sector itself needing to to really provide the tools that the private sector needs in order to, um, to feel comfortable taking those risks or to be successful after taking those risks. And, and I think in the end, it's a win-win situation. And that's where in Senegal, it's been important looking at this new initiative that um, I've been highly involved in, which is called the Consortium for E-Commerce, which was uh, spearheaded by the Ministry of Commerce. And very quickly, what they realized is that e-commerce was going to become extremely important and a major and a major priority for the country, especially with everything that happened with COVID. And, but then again, um, 
is the government really, is the public sector really in the best position to develop, let's say, a marketplace for merchants um, in Senegal, just because we already have so many. Are we looking at the public sector becoming a competitor to the private sector, which became one of the biggest challenges in terms of getting the private sector involved? And them looking at the public sector and saying, are you here to really compete with us? Are you here to build another uh, another market uh, online marketplace um, that's just going to be that's just going to cloud everything we're doing? And therefore, this the work that we've done at the consortium has actually been quite interesting. It's um, it's divided in two groups: the public sector, which is the the uh, Collège Non Marchand, and the and the private sector, which is the Collège Marchand, which I actually am currently leading. We have about 70 members of various actors within the e-commerce ecosystem um, just on the private sector side and over 50 members on the public sector. What we've done is work very closely together. And I, the reason I believe this model is working is because we're each understanding what our roles really are. Um, the private sector role right now has been to dream big. It's been to identify what the needs are, to go into the regions and do a full survey, understanding what are the needs um, in order to get uh, the, the woman that's selling, uh, that's selling uh, produce at the market to be able to sell online. And we found that some of the major issues always end up being the same. It's um, a delivery solution. It's having access to delivery companies. It's having access to payment solutions. And those. And, and so what we've done is saying, let's build a full platform that's not going to be a marketplace that's going to compete with what everybody else is looking to do, but that's going to make it much easier for anyone that's looking to go online to easily create their store, to easily have access to all the payment solutions that are available so that it's fully integrated uh, through APIs as well as, um, as plugins. And then on the third side, do the same thing with delivery solutions so that you can use technologies such as USSD, uh, the web or mobile app in order to very quickly identify and geolocation, I should say, to very quickly identify who's delivering your solutions right then and there. On the other side, when we talk about delivery, one of the biggest challenges we have and where we really need the public sector to focus on and which now has become a, a, a priority is first to be able to know where you're delivering. So to have a much better um, uh, localization system, to have a much better addressing set, uh, um, uh, system, so that when we actually have an address of delivery, that it is what the, what the person is saying it is. On the other side, when we talk about USSD, having the government support on that as well. So we've been mm. working Together, to put together all of these different solutions in order to move forward the e-commerce for Senegal. And I believe that it's um, it's been quite a great experience that will hopefully become an example for other countries in Africa and developing countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Biram. I look forward to hearing much more about that experience in, in Senegal and hopefully it inspires West Africa and, and internationally uh, more broadly beyond your borders. I think we're getting close to the end of this. I'd like to turn back to Fabrizio. Um, and I know we have two or three minutes before we have to wrap up, but all of what we've been discussing today, Fabrizio, whether it's about coordination at the national level, at the international level, between private stakeholders, public stakeholders, all of that is going to require measurement and access to data. And obviously, there's a lot of challenges in terms of being able to, to measure progress. And so I'd like to get your views on how can the UN in that space play a role? How can other actors play a role? And are we far from from the concept of um, public good in terms of data to be able to measure our collective progress towards inclusive digital economies. Over to you, Fabrizio. I think you're muted. Thank you. Uh, I, I think this is absolutely critical. I, I think establishing common accepted standards and definitions uh, to, in order to measure progress against, measure gaps against, is a precondition for progress. Uh, I, you know, I spent most of my career in the humanitarian sphere uh, with, with the UN High Commissioner for Refugees and other parts of the system, and a little bit in the development sphere. 
And in those areas, it's unthinkable that you could you could make um, uh, progress without measurement. You cannot deal with malnutrition if you don't have a definition for acute malnutrition, mild malnutrition. If you can't measure how you're falling short, it's very difficult to target resources and come up with with appropriate strategies. Uh, likewise, um, if we didn't imagine, if we didn't have globally accepted definitions for poverty or extreme poverty, if we didn't have the Human Development Index, without these tools, um, progress in recent decades would be much greater. And it still astounds me, you know, with three or four years exposure now to this domain, how little accepted standards there are. We talk about affordable access, but we have no definition of what that means, affordable access. The broadband have put forward uh, a possible definition, which I think we need to build upon. But but we really need uh, common definitions in order to establish targets, in order to invest resources appropriately, in order to have appropriate national, regional and international uh, policies. I think that is urgent. It is an area ITU is where it's one of the main recommendations of the Secretary General's roadmap. It is an area that we're working on with ITU based on work that has already been done. But I but I think this is I think this is absolutely um, uh, uh, essential. I mean, just to give you one indication, affordable access in Africa, um, the the average. Uh, range um, of of what it costs to be connected, um, the average is about seven or eight percent of um, the average monthly income. That's the equivalent in New York. If you look at the average income in New York, that's the equivalent of paying about five hundred or six hundred dollars per month uh, to get one gigabyte of, of of data access per month. That means that um, it, whereas the real cost in New York is around $50, that means in New York we're paying about a, a tenth of what in real terms of what is currently the average payment in Africa. That's obviously not sustainable. We're not going to get inclusive anything if we can continue that way. But we need the metrics in order to identify those sorts of problems and, and to overcome them. And incidentally, in Africa, there are many states where the cost is uh, up to 20% of the average monthly income for one gigabyte of data. So this is just a small illustration of why metrics is so important. And we need to not only measure, but have universally accepted standards against which we're measuring. And that's the big challenge of our time. Thank you very much, Fabrizio. I would have uh, many other questions. This has been a very interesting and exciting conversation indeed. Thank you very much, everyone. I have a thousand questions to ask you, but I'm running out of time. So I'd like to pass it over to uh, Francois to send us off. And thanks again for being with us today. It's been amazing to have uh, you as panelists to discuss this important topic. Thank you very much.